What's up, YouTube family? My name is Shaka Shabazz, and this is African American Made. Today, I'm talking with Mr. Kareem Neal, the 2019 Arizona Teacher of the Year and a 2022 inductee into the National Teachers Hall of Fame. This team, Mr. Neal, has invited me to Phoenix Maryville High School to talk about his exemplary career as a special education teacher, his expertise in restorative justice and diversity and inclusion, and what inspired him to devote his life to shaping young minds. I'm impressed with Mr. Neal's accomplishments and only hope to mirror his success in my work. So, sit up in your seats, prepare to take notes, because today we're taking lessons from Mr. Kareem Neal. There's always a, a whole parade of things that educators have to deal with from an administrative level, executive level, and dealing mm -hmm. with parents and teachers. Uh, what are some of the challenges you see in your experience? Outside of the things you meant, if I'm not talking about economic challenges. Well, specific to some of those in any, any of those areas that you may. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I'm, I'm seeing educate, I mean, uh, economic challenges hit hardest. One, because I teach in an area where that's a thing. And so, you know, it hit hardest at the time of COVID. It hit hard, right? And, and when we had to go online and no one had a computer and our district had to figure out ways to get them computers and food and stuff like that. So, you know, the economic realities are, are so difficult for so many people. And the, it's wild being online, having conversations with people or, you know, even in political spaces, going to like a political rally or something like that. It is interesting how the people talking don't have to worry about things like whether or not they'll eat. <laughs> Do they have the technology or even a backpack or a book bag or a backpack or books? you know, to learn, you know, some of the basic things. So economic That's a barrier to learning, isn't it? It's such a huge barrier to learning, economics. Yeah. And, and you weren't so, about if you got to eat, if you didn't eat breakfast this morning. Or, yeah, and then yeah. housing security right now, you know, because we're seeing it on the ground. If, if you work in an area like I work, you know that it could be tomorrow a student doesn't show up and what happened? I, I don't know, I heard they moved. There was a sign on their door. They were evicted and... Maybe they moved with the relatives. Uh, so, yeah, when we started teaching online for COVID, there were three, just like three kids where I, I just, it was like, I don't, I didn't see them again. You know, they had to move. They couldn't get or could never get the computer or whatever the case may be. The, the district said, oh, we, they, they eventually sent people to houses and after a while. They were trying to do it by having people do a drive through for COVID safety and things like that. And they eventually, for kids they couldn't find out, they would go to their house. And there were so many kids where it was just like, oh, they're not even there anymore. And so it's just like, you know, because the reality is for folks who don't have money, if, you know, when jobs closed for a couple of weeks, it was over for them. They could no longer pay their bills, right? Um, but, it, you know, coming into now, where that's not the case anymore, but now, Housing is so expensive, right? The housing costs rose and rose and rose after COVID. And so, you know, with a kid with special needs, it takes a while for them to get comfortable with the teacher because we are doing things like we're using feeding tubes. We, we are sometimes just feeding a student. We're changing kids. You know, we're, we're, sometimes there's explosive behaviors. We're dealing with things that typical classrooms aren't dealing with. So for them to just be uprooted out of nowhere because... You know, you couldn't make a couple of house payments or, or something like that. It is devastating for their education because w what happens with my students is we get in a groove and figure out all of those things, all of their, you know, physical and emotional needs. And then the learning starts coming faster once all the trust is built. And it's like as you keep getting moved around and people who are poor are constantly moving around right now. They're, they're sharing houses with people and then apartments are not houses with people. And they're getting moved around. And when our students get moved around, it, it takes a big toll on their educational process where, you know, there might be some students out there in gen ed or even maybe gifted kids or something like that where if they move to three or four places in a school year, they would, they would be able to retain. That's just not the case with our students because it takes a, a lot of time to, to even understand how to manage all the, all the needs that they have outside of just academics. So how do you and your colleagues deal with that emotionally and mentally when you go home? It was, re it was really hard for a while. It was, for me, I am a, a really 
you know, easygoing kind of person. I, um, and they're generally, like, you know how some people, their, their baseline level of happiness is high. I'm one of those people. But, man, after we got back in school after COVID and when I was seeing that kind of stuff happen, whether it was like a kid would just leave or, you know, I had a couple family members um, die of COVID and this area was hit very hard with COVID. Um, you know, I actually got a bit angry, you know, taking it out on maybe like writing to admin, like, y'all need to fix something, you know, because I couldn't figure out how to make it better for my students. And that is a frustrating thing for, one, a teacher who's, I've been doing it for a while and you usually have a firm handle on the education, you know, part of it all. But this was like basic needs that I was like, I wish I could help and I can't. And so I think I, I, I was angry, I was sad. Um, and my staff, it was the same. They, they seem more sad than angry. And um, it was tough. It was tough times. And it, you know, it's still sometimes tough. But I do think, you know, we have come a bit closer to normalcy. So it's a little bit better. What makes you successful as an educator? Uh, well, I think it is my effort and my love of it. So, you know, I... I get to put forth a stronger effort. And I think I know part of it is I, I don't have a family on my own. Um, I, I was married. I got divorced from my wife like three years ago. Um, I don't have any children. So I think I've always been able to, to give a lot of time to it because I do think it's a job that if you just put in the eight hours, you're going to have a hard time being successful, you know. So I'm, I'm always able to give a little bit more, which is helpful, even doing like after school clubs and things like that. Because once you make stronger, you know, connections with students, they are then giving more, right? And, and then that makes your job so much easier. Um, so, so, so it's effort and, and just, you know, I like love it a lot. <laughs> and so I've always loved it. I, you know, I won these awards and all of a sudden everybody tried to take me out of the classroom. I'm like, no, I know this is the thing I love. Don't want to leave it. And so, you know, that resonates with students, right? Stu I, I wish all students in their classroom had a teacher that they knew, loved the job, loved them. And, you know, they, they realize that it is because they want to be here. Not like, oh, they have to show up for a paycheck or they couldn't do anything else in life. But more like they just love it and want to be here for us. Um, because I think it brings out so much in students. Diversity and inclusion. I guess we've touched on it a bit, but specifically the implementation of it from your point of view and what you do as a professional, as an educator, or talking to your colleagues or um, your students about diversity and inclusion, what's your approach to it? Um, my approach, I'll, I'll start with inclusion first because I think a lot of special ed teachers that's on our minds a lot. Um, and, and I think diversity comes with it. But um, mine is to, to make sure that colleagues of mine, but also schools, because I, I speak to a lot of schools all the time, um, school districts and things like that, understand that we should not be centering any students at all. So the, the inclusion process oftentimes makes folks in special education programs feel like their peers are above them in some way, right? That they should look up to their peers. And in a lot of ways, my students thought like that for a while. So I started to say, we have to be aware of how we're doing that, right? We have to not ever make someone feel like they are not centered in the learning and that they are being welcomed in by another group of kids, right, or, or another group of teachers. So, but, you know, my thing is if, if, if you're saying, oh, special ed kids need to go into gen ed classes and learn some things from them, well, then gen ed kids also need to come to special ed classes and learn some things from them because we can all learn some things from each other, right? And so that's where I am at the way we center things. And, and then that you know, that, then diversity falls into place also. So if you have a school where they're not seeing the same thing centered, they're like, oh, just like most schools that I see on TV, in the news, or in person, it is centered around white, upper middle class, you know, males, et cetera, et cetera, you know, gen ed, all of the things. Um, if, you're, if you're saying, 
well, this is just a place for everyone. We're not inviting you in. This is your place, right? Because it's a school. Schools are community schools. They're community places. And so I think about it like that. If you find a way to not center it, you don't have to worry about how inclusive practices are going to look. Mm -hmm. You won't have to worry about diversity because the, the truth of the matter is the reason why, one of the reasons why we have a hard time recruiting black folks into schools is not just salary and, you know, and, and you know, uh, not just the way, you know, educators or black educators are treated in schools. It is also how schools were for us when we were young. So when I talk to a lot of friends about like how much I love teaching, who I grew up with, they're like, bruh, schools wasn't for us like that. Because it wasn't for a lot of young black yeah. kids. Yeah, I could definitely attest to that. Right? Definitely. And so, you know, for me, I, a lot of teachers, you know, they took me in. I was a good student, so they took me in and they loved on me when all my classmates they didn't pay attention to. Right. And so people don't want to come back to that kind of thing. You definitely get lost in the sauce. And particularly, right? And, and particularly, like, for myself, coming from the inner city, um, horrible, horrible formative years and school yes. experiences and misdiagnoses and yes. so why would um, you want to go back to it? Yeah. and the ideal or the practice of being more punitive than being corrective exactly or, you know uh, so things like that so, so yeah definitely. so if you're not showing the students that your school is an inclusive and diverse place where no one is centered you're not going to be able to ever get it and so no one's going to want to come back to it you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. If schools were like that, people would say, man, I want to be a part of seeing how that school, mm -hmm. you know, grows and, and, and how great it could become because they felt it. But until people start feeling that, it's going to be pretty difficult. So I think that kind of thing, it needs to be automatically inclusive, automatically diverse. You consult other organizations and groups in educational outlets yes what are some of the most common issues for lack of a better word that they call on you for in, in terms of consulting um, they call on me most for inclusive practices and restorative justice and so you know you touched on something during the last question where you you and I, it might have been based on your experience it sounds like mm -hmm. where you were saying the school was pretty punitive and mm -hmm. y'all definitely didn't feel like y'all were welcome particularly in inner city places and so i go to a lot of schools like that where it is man why are our suspension and expulsion rates still so bad for black kids mm -hmm. why are they still so bad for native american kids right and so i i have been training in restorative justice for like maybe seven years and I thought it was a really good way to kind of take that, like I said, I have an activist spirit, mm -hmm. to cover a multitude of things. Because what happens is if you're, if you're in the kind of school that's saying we are building community around our students, we are not looking to be punitive, we're looking to be restorative, we're looking to build stronger relationships, then you can cover a lot of, well, we're, of course then we're not going to leave out the special ed kids. Of course then we're not going to, have biases towards students and show them by, you know, sending them out of our classrooms and expelling and ex suspending them. So I talk a lot about restorative justice. I try and talk about the misconceptions because a lot of people think it's just like a replacement for discipline or whatever, and it's more about building community so that people don't want to harm, uh, uh, you know, a place. And if they do, being able to actually try and work through what caused that harm on both sides. Um, and so, yeah, those are the things I talk about most. I talk sometimes about culturally responsive teaching, but I would say restorative justice and inclus inclusion are the two things I sp speak about most. And, and typically, I am, when I'm talking about restorative justice, I'm talking about building community, paying attention to your biases, finding ways to have relationships built so that you can have restorative conversations, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people also think you can just get two people together who fought and put them in a room and like, let's have a restorative conversation. Well, if they don't have a relationship to restore. You know, you're having a restorative conversation, you're just having a conversation. It makes sense. It makes <laughs> so, sense. So yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. So that's between students and between students and It can staff. be, no, no, it can be staff, student, staff, staff, staff student, staff, student. Okay. that's right. So now, those cultural biases and those personal prejudices, whatever mm -hmm. they may be, in your experience, 
have your client or the, the people in your client's organizations, have they been forthright about the source of their bias? Or have they admitted it? Or do they just absorb what you're saying and kind of... Um, I would say it's split. Okay. Okay, I would say it's split. I think a lot of times, you know, I'll go into a place and, and they will say, man, it's rough here. But a lot of times it's like a, a pocket of people who are saying it's rough here and the other people are just going about their business. They go and they respect. But I rarely have mm -hmm. a time where I go and people are like, this is BS. What are you... What are you telling me? Do you think a lot of these problems are just the culture of a particular school? Yes, I do. So I think what happens is when, you know, when I'm called into a school, it's usually because they have uh, school culture problems, right? And, you know, those things come from a variety of reasons, but it's not just an individual being biased towards students. Right. It is a place that is allowing it without thinking. Right, because I don't think there's many schools out there or even many individual educators who are saying, I want to come in and I want to punish all the black kids I can find. Right, but, but it's happening. So it, it, or why are some places not intentionally saying, hey, we, why would we allow discipline disparities to be so great amongst black and white students? Yeah, so let me you know? offer a little pushback on that if mm -hmm. I can. The question is, why are we treating kids that way, a certain sector of kids? In other words, we're treating kids, we're treating kids differently. Without a question. So to me, in my mind, that's just blatant. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of what the, the personal biases are. Yeah, the impact is what makes the most difference. So I don't, yeah, I don't right. care. Thank, yeah, thank I don't care if you're that. not, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Sorry, I come in talking yeah. about impact and intent, yeah. right? And I know your job is to, to yes. help guide. And yeah, to so not their, to, you know. their intent is what I'm saying is not always malicious, right? It's rarely malicious. So I, we, we don't As care a, if your mind is pure, if you're the least racist person in the room or whatever right, people right, right, say right. who are harming these folks. Yeah. It is a, you got to examine yourself and yeah. your own discipline practices and, and do something with it. Otherwise, your school should say, this isn't the place for you, right? Yeah, so, th so schools that are saying they're committed to it, they have to fully commit to it and say, all right, if we still have mm -hmm. three teachers who are constantly sending out black kids and they're, and they're not willing to examine their biases, mm -hmm. then maybe this isn't the place for you. Yeah, because I, I mean, I understand that the, ar the, um, the argument could be hard to make if mm -hmm. all the other kids were angels yeah, yeah right and they never gave a problem look look they just never gave a problem yeah but i got three kids here or five kids or whatever that just happen to be black and they're they're ripping up the place yeah so i mean there's no argument to be made against whether they're okay why are you yep. doing this right you know yeah but if there's some it's sharing a wealth on the 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 badness but we're we're using different tactics to address that. Exactly. You know, that's kind of, I mean, as a, as a, a one-time parent, and, well, not a one-time parent, but of a school-age yeah. kid. And as a kid sitting in school and being um, a target of that, I, I, that kind of hits home with me a yes. little bit. You know? So it that's is. just a little personal. Yeah. <laughs> so so for, fortunately, the organization that hired me are hiring me to change their culture, and that is the kinds of things I'm saying. I, I don't. Their, their intent isn't what we're dealing with. We have mm -hmm. to deal with the impact. Right. And right. if that doesn't change, then you need to make staffing changes. It's bottom right. line. Right. <laughs> bottom line. Because I know there's some kids you don't want in your classroom, of course. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like people that watch this video to know about Kareem Neal? Um, let's see. Well, I would like them to know that I am truly committed to educating kids and on a, on a different, so I'm a teacher who was, I'm part of the union because I believe in labor unions. I am, um, you know, I, I, I love education. I love my school, right? I, I think most people have good intentions, but I am a person who is saying every kid needs the opportunity to succeed. And I, I didn't throw all the rest out the window. For instance, like I, I have um, a friend who, you know, he, he has a podcast, it's called Eight Black Hands, and they talk about, 
you know, kids and public schools and unions and how it might not be right for all black kids. I'm like, if it's not, then take your kids to the place that's right. Because I, I just feel like because it's that important, education is that important, that I don't, I don't care how it gets done, but all kids need somebody solid. And so for my kids, they're getting it. Mm -hmm. And I would say to a parent, if they feel like their kid's not getting it in my classroom, tell me and I'm going to try and fix it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wish all teachers were like that. Um, but I know that's not the case. And, I, and, and I, that is part of why I'm out there doing the restorative work, doing the, the inclusion work, doing the culturally responsive work, because I, I want to see all teachers view it that way. Like, man, if there's a kid sitting in my class and they're not getting what, they're need, it is, it, what they need, it is a me thing, and I got to fix that. Right. So, yeah, so I just want people to know that, that whatever the child needs, I'm willing to try and give them. So if someone wanted to reach out to you for, um, for uh, counsel, consulting, how can, how can they reach you? Oh, um, I guess email would be best. It is kareemnil7 at gmail. Um, but I'm super active on Facebook, Twitter. A lot of people reach me that way, too, and LinkedIn. Okay. Um, and I think all of my, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, I think on Facebook, I'm, I'm just Kareem Neal. Um, on Twitter, I, b I believe I'm also just Kareem Neal. And, okay. um, and we'll uh, put it in, on the, in the description, But I can, too, so. I can throw them in, yeah. So. And we'll put it in the description yep, yep, in the yep, video. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Neal, it has been an honor to talk to you today. Thanks for having and thank me. you so much for taking your time out to talk with me today. My pleasure. And uh, African American Aid is about highlighting and um, profiling men and women like yourself that are out here doing it that don't get the, the recognition. There's this ideal that we're not out here moving and shaking, and we are. No and doubt. I thank you so much for being a part of this world that shapes young minds and uh, get them prepared for the future. No doubt.